Okay, my people, welcome back. Um, let's go into some more detail associated with uh, these chi-square tests. Uh, on this page in the notes, you can see um, I have outlined, this is the, uh, the summary of the four-step process for goodness of fit. And these two are in section two in here. So I'm gonna really just zoom in on the center column here, breaking down the four-step process for the chi-square test for homogeneity. So many, many of the aspects of the four-step process are the same. And we're gonna discover here quickly what's different in these two particular tests with the four-step process. All right, so the requirements are still the same, the hypothesis, Key word in here, we're going to make sure we use the word difference in the null. Excuse me, the null is no difference, and the alternative is there is a difference. Okay, you're still going to describe um, um, the distribution and the groups, and you can do that in detail uh, within your null and uh, alternative hypotheses, uh, meaning you got to describe stuff in context. Then make sure that your alpha level uh, is stated. Um, in the um, the state step as well. Okay, so here's an example here using the uh, ones we saw earlier. Uh, remember, this is the difference in one variable across two or more groups. That's what we have right there. Okay, keyword, no difference in difference. All right, if the conditions are met, we're going to perform a what? We're going to perform, it's called a chi-squared test for homogeneity. Okay. The, record, the AP board says if you're not quite sure, just put chi-square test, okay? Um, so that's something to consider. There are three conditions, and these conditions, you've seen these before, but the last one is a little uh, different in here. So the first one is the random condition. Make sure everything's coming from a random sample. The next one's a 10% condition. The last one, the large counts, is... In the first section, we saw all the expected counts had to be greater than or equal to five. So across all three tests in here, they have to be greater than or equal to five. This one has to be greater than or equal to five. This one has to be greater than or equal to five. So make sure uh, you understand that's quite different than the other types of inference in other chapters. And again, it is not the observed counts. It's the expected counts. So when you collect data, that's your observed counts. These are the expected counts that they are that all have to be greater than five. So in the previous video, we did a couple of examples, and one of them was the uh, finding the expected counts with our calculator with um, with Agora High School in here, and you can see we do not meet um this condition of the large count condition notice two of the eight are less than five that is no good in fact even if one of them is less than eight excuse me less than five it, it you do not pass so later on in the chapter we are going to talk about uh how do we kind of work around that how do we kind of fix that that's what this little note to myself was hey in the conditions what if um, they're not? What do we do? What is there a workaround if um, we don't have them to be greater than five? And a little precursor to that is we're going to take this category here, and in order to make it work, we kind of have to get rid of it. But we can't get rid of those observed counts. We have to kind of put them somewhere. So one strategy would be to, and you could do this after the fact is combine it with a different group. So maybe in the end, I would only have three um, different categorical outcomes with the return date. I would have um, the one that is the start of the school year um, for next year. I would have May 4th, which is um, currently uh, the day we're going to be expected to go back. And then these two in here would have to be combined. And so when they're combined, notice in the uh, 
that would be 14 for the females and seven for the males. And if I had 14 and seven, and then I did the expected counts, that is going to ensure that all of those numbers in here, all of these expected counts are greater than or equal to five. So just keep that in mind as we do more examples in here. So let's go back to our summary. So this was our goodness of fit. This is a test for homogeneity. Where did we get sidetracked? We got sidetracked over here with the tricky large counts condition. So don't expect um, our, large, our large counts are always going to be met. We have to make sure they are always greater than five. Okay, um, how do you um, get your expected counts? I recommend you use your matrices. I like to use matrix A and B to find my expected counts. And here's an example of some observed counts and some expected counts. You're gonna to have to report those. So make sure you are reporting your expected counts. Do you have to provide all of the calculations for those? No, but you actually have to perform, uh, report a few. And I'll show you the AP board's recommendations for justifying your work to do that. In the do step, we're gonna use some technology in here. Make sure we state the procedural name, the chi-square test uh, right there. We're gonna report the chi-squared statistic, which our calculator does when we do chi-squared test statistic, excuse me, the chi-squared test. Uh, report the degrees of freedom. Here's the, once again, the formula for degrees of freedom. Uh, do the p-value and the sketch as well. So this is how we do the chi-squared test statistic. That is this total sum of observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And then we're, here's our sketch. And then we're gonna have our three requirements in our, um, our contextual um, conclusion. That's where we say, hey, uh, since the p-value is this and it's greater than or less than the alpha, val uh, alpha value, we're going to make a decision. We're going to either reject the null or fail to reject the null. And then you talk about it in context. So that's the details of the test for homogeneity. Now, on the right-hand side here, almost everything is the same for the test for independence. So what are the differences, no pun intended, is we don't use the word difference. We use the word association for the null and the alternative right there. We're not using the word difference. Okay, everything else is the same. Uh, here's examples here of, of um, um, some contextual examples for the null and the alternative right there. Um, what else? I cannot stress enough. It's no association and association. Remember, we're trying to see if there's an association between two uh, variables, and that's called the test for independence. So if the requires, requirements are met, uh, this is the chi-squared test for independence. Notice it's the same three conditions as stated earlier for the test for homogeneity. This is the same exact formula for expected counts. Uh, we use the same exact calculator procedural name. We report the same exact things. Um, there's our little sketch. Uh, our conclusion's the same. Everything's the same. So you can see there's many aspects of these two tests in here that are the same. It really comes down to the initial question that you're really asking. And so those initial really questions that you're really asking and good at practice at what, what are the differences, um, how can I tell the differences between independence and homogeneity, I highly recommend the game that we've been playing all throughout second semester. Click on this link this link and make sure you check on these boxes in here and go through several examples and try to see the initial question that is being asked. If you sense that we are talking about trying to tell to see if there's a difference between a ver one variable across two or more groups, then that's going to be the test for homogeneity. If you see that we're talking about one population and we are asking it for two separate variables within one population, actually two or more variables, then you're gonna see that is the test for independence. So um, please click on that link, 
try to get some more practice. Um, okay, I highly recommend you go to your textbook. This is a great, great problem. If you haven't already heard, uh, we have no multiple choice on our AP exam. It's all free response. So these are three valuable, three free response questions that you may be asked related to chi-square tests. So check that out. That uses the main campus versus the Commonwealth and Facebook use. On the very next page, you're going to see there are six more free response questions dealing with the same scenario in here. Keep in mind that you can always click on show answer in your online textbook and they're providing the answers after you think through those free response questions. That's very, very powerful. Over here, this is just another example I have used in the past. Uh, this one was observed counts dealing with uh, different groups in here and their texting habits. And then we calculated the expected. We would calculate with our calculator uh, the p-value and so forth. That's just more practice you can get. Notice this would be a three by four matrix. And these are just the observed counts. Uh, this is that warning I was referring to earlier. And this is what we really need to pay attention to. Uh, we recommend writing out the first few terms of the chi-squared calculation followed by dot, dot, dot. So remember, you have to find the expected value after you know the observed, and you can get that with your calculator. And then you have to write out what? The observed minus expected squared divided by the expected. And then write the next one out. Observed minus expected squared divided by expected plus dot, dot, dot. Write out at least two of them. And then understand and label, that's going to be our chi-squared statistic. So yes, they know you can get the chi-squared statistic from your calculator, but it is much more important to the AP board that you can convince them that you know where this number is coming from. So that is the grand total of all the sums of all the differences squared divided by the expected. So make sure you keep that in mind as you're showing your work for those four step processes for the uh, four step process. Okay, another Jason Molesky treasure I want you to click on in your online textbook is this video dealing with uh, p-values and what conclusions you can make. Also, this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the differences between making a conclusion in the four-step process and interpreting the p-value in context. So we've seen this before the last few chapters. This is one of our Achilles heel and weaknesses. Make sure you can understand how to write a conclusion in the four-step process and make sure if they ask you in a free response question, hey, can you interpret the p-value? That is not the same thing as using your alpha value in here. So make sure you're reading this particular um, cookie cutter response for interpreting a p-value in the response of a chi-squared test statistic. And by the way, the chi-squared test statistic gives us that probability. Um, okay, that's all I wanna say for this video. All right, I'll be back.